Okay, um, welcome everyone to this um, third of the e-seminar series from the Health Informatics um, Forum. It's my pleasure to um, introduce the two speakers for today. Um, we're really fortunate to have um, Associate Professor Robin Whittaker, who's a public health physician with Waitemata DHB, which is a district health board here in New Zealand. Um, she is uh, also uh, uh, as, as said, Associate Professor at the School of Population Health within the Institute, National Institute for Health Innovation. Um, also have Rosie Dobson. Um, Rosie is a research fellow at the uh, School of Population Health in the National uh, Institute of Health Innovation. So Rosie and Robin, um, colleagues of mine um, here in, and based here in Auckland, uh, New Zealand, uh, we'll be talking about using text messaging to extend diabetes self-management support outside the clinical setting. Um, and they will talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll be open to some questions and I'll be able to relay these questions to uh, Rosie and Robin um, for you too, uh, for you all this morning. Thank you. Great, um, good morning everybody. I'm just gonna turn our slides on uh, somewhere. Great, so, so thanks for joining us. Uh, well, it is morning here. Anyway, it may not be where you are. Uh, so we're going to talk about a program that we developed called SMS for BG. It's around using text messaging to extend diabetes self-management support outside the clinic. Uh, in New Zealand, we have <clears throat> around 240,000 people with diabetes, but the, the main point there is that there is much higher prevalence uh, in Māori, the indigenous population of New Zealand, Pacific, and those living in the most deprived areas of the country. Uh, not just higher prevalence, but also worse outcomes for those groups. And so we think it's really important that we look for innovative solutions to support those groups of people in particular, uh, people who are not using services currently, uh, who don't have services available for them because they live very uh, remote, for Māori and Pacific, and for those who have limited technology access as well. Uh, so we've been working in this field of in-health for quite some time now, uh, probably around 15 years. And over that time, we've developed a little bit of a framework to help us in our development process. Uh, so this is, uh, the top part of that is, is the slide, is that framework. Uh, and then the arrows down the bottom show you what we've done on this instance with our diabetes program. Uh, so the main points here are that we think it's really important to have a theoretical basis throughout your development process so that you know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, we use behaviour change theory and techniques that have been proven to work. And over the years, we have adapted these to fit with text messaging really well. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, we also think it's important to have a focus on how the program will be implemented uh, all the way through so that we're making sure that we're we're developing something that can easily be translated into practice at the end of the research process. But most importantly, probably is that top arrow around target population involvement. And so every step of the way, which are the white boxes on the big blue arrow, every one of those steps, we're involving our end users or our target population. Uh, so you can see that we start with conceptualization, consultation, go through formative work, and, and reiterating the intervention development over and over with pre-testing as much as is needed. Uh, then we do a pilot study. Uh, then we tend to do a large pragmatic community-based RCT. And then we're looking at the impact of implementation. So we'll go through some of these steps for this program, uh, starting with consultation and conceptualization. So this really came from working with uh, the district health board that I work at. So we were working with the health services from the start uh, and we talked a lot to patients and clinicians and working in diabetes and general practitioners around what are the gaps currently? Uh, what, what would people, how would people see that technology could help in uh, filling the gaps that currently exist? And what we learned is that even where patients felt that they were getting really good care, they really wanted more support in between their clinic visits. Or, or support that was available to people who were not getting um, access to, to regular care. So that feeling of, uh, yeah, I may be getting some help with my diabetes for you know half an hour every three months or six months, but for the rest of my life, I'm looking after my diabetes myself and I'd really like to feel more supported 
during that time and gets more help during that time. So that was kind of where the idea of a messaging program came from, uh, that actually we could use messaging to provide that regular ongoing support that would uh, fill in the gaps basically for them. Uh, so we initially set up a Māori advisory group, uh, which included people uh, with diabetes as well as clinicians. And we had a focus on developing a Māori version of the program from the very beginning and the input that we got from Māori patients that that advisory group helped us to get was really vital in the way that the program developed and in the tone of the messages. And that it actually applied to everyone, to the whole um, uh, intervention, not just the Māori version of the intervention, uh, because the, the input they gave us was so good around things like, uh, you know, reducing the focus on targets and numbers uh, and being more supportive and motivational. Uh, so we did a lot of reviews of what was out there already and of the current evidence, of course, and we looked at, at all sorts of possible tools. But we came back to, to messaging in the end. And there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, text messaging is so ubiquitously available to everyone, regardless of what kind of phone they have, whether they have uh, any credit on that phone, where they live in the country, uh, how good their connectivity is pretty much everyone can receive text messages. So in terms of really reaching into those priority populations I mentioned at the start, we find that text messaging is still the best way to do that. Uh, many people are not, not keen to download an app or uh, and don't have necessarily a data plan or access to the internet available to them all the time. But also over the years of, of the work that we've been doing, we found that messaging works really well. Uh, there's something about these type of messages coming directly to your phone uh, which is very personal, it's very direct, it's very supportive, and it works really well to support healthy behaviour change is what we've found, and there's plenty of evidence to support that. So that's what we did. We set out to, to develop this, uh, this text message programme uh, that looks a bit like this. Uh, I'll just ex explain some of it. Uh, I think one of the core concepts of the programme was around control, uh, helping people to feel like they could be in better control of their diabetes, and that if they took better control of their condition themselves, then they would have a better outcome and a better trajectory over time. And so we, we took that concept from the very beginning to give them control over their program as well. So they got to choose uh, a lot of which modules they would have in their program. And that meant they also chose how many messages, the, the frequency of the messages and, and also the duration of the program. So just very quickly, they could choose, uh, going from the left-hand side, they could choose to uh, have a Māori program Pacific or a non-Māori non-Pacific program. Uh, they could choose to receive messages about insulin if they wanted. Um, they could choose their lifestyle module. So this is, they could choose to get extra support and messaging around healthy eating, around increasing their physical activity or around stress and mood management. Uh, they could also choose whether to get blood glucose monitoring reminders. And if they chose to get messages that would remind them to test their blood glucose, then they could choose the frequency with which they got them. And that could be anything from randomly once a week through to four or five times a day if they really wanted it. And if they did choose to get these reminders, they could also respond to them if they wanted. Again, not, not compulsory, but if they chose to, they could respond to the text message reminder with the number of their blood glucose level. And then as you can see uh, on the right hand side there, we would graph those numbers for them over time. And this is for purely for self-monitoring and review so that they could see their own trends over time of their blood glucose levels uh, and work out what was going on for themselves. If they wanted to, of course, they could take that to, to their clinician when they went to see them. But really the main purpose was around self-monitoring and review for the purposes of behavior change. Uh, so you can see uh, what we developed then is a very kind of um, modular and personal program where they got to choose what their program looked like, but also personally tailored. Uh, so if you look at the examples of the messages down the bottom, you can see that we could insert their name and we can also insert their motivations for good diabetes control into the messages to again make it feel much more personally tailored to them. Uh, so this is just a summary of our kind of logic uh, diagram of what we were doing. Obviously, on the right-hand side, what we're really aiming for is the prevention of long-term complications of diabetes and improved quality of life. 
and we, we wanted to do that by improving their long-term glycemic control uh, and this was uh, what we were looking for is the changes in the HbA1c over time. Uh, those, that change in HbA1c was only going to come about if we could get them to change their behaviours around eating, being active, taking their meds, monitoring their glucose, etc. as you can see there in the green box. And so the this kind of constructs underneath what we were doing were really around increasing their self-efficacy to, to change these things and to have better control of their diabetes, increasing their diabetes knowledge and their um, changing any incorrect illness perceptions around that. And also really importantly, increasing their, their perceptions of social support or of support for their diabetes, as I said in the beginning. And so the program that we developed is really mainly motivational and supportive. Um, it provides some education and reminders, but it's not a clinical program. It's really about motivating and supporting people to take better control of their diabetes. Uh, so th those were the first few stages of our development. Uh, and then we went on to a pilot study uh, that was um, supported by the health service that I work in, the Waitemata District Health Board. We recruited 42 people from primary care and secondary care sites and gave them the program. Uh, the feedback that we get we got from that was incredibly positive, uh, and we saw some really good results in terms of dropping their HbA1c as well. Uh, but this was just a pilot program. So what we did then was use the feedback that participants gave us uh, and refined the program, improved the program, uh, and then we were able to get funding for a large randomised control trial. So I'll hand over here to Rosie. So um, following the positive results from the pilot study um, and this um, indication that there was potentially some positive effects of the program, um, we were lucky to secure funding um, to undertake a nationwide um, RCT of the effectiveness of the program in terms of improving glycemic control, HbA1c. So we conducted a nine-month, a two-arm parallel randomised control trial of um, adults with poorly controlled diabetes. Um, they were recruited from across New Zealand, um, as you can see on the map on the right of the slide, um, including an emphasis on rural and remote communities of New Zealand. Um, so we had roughly a third of our sample of 366 coming from areas um, classified as rural and remote, um, and roughly a third coming from the ethnic groups or the cultural groups that we were particularly trying to target with this group, so Māori and Pacific peoples. Um, we had both people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the study, with roughly a third being type 1 and, and the majority being type 2. Um, there was a huge variation in um, people taking part in this trial of people who were very newly diagnosed being referred to the program, but also um, someone who had had diabetes for nearly 60 years. So you can see that there was um, quite a bit of variation. And what we found was that at nine months, um, those that had received the SMS 4BG program um, experienced reduction in HbA1c than those that were in a usual care control group. Um, and not only that, 75% of those that received the program actually experienced a decrease in HbA1c. Um, so the, um, the decrease once that was put into the model, controlling for um, culture or ethnicity, as well as whether they lived rurally or not and type of diabetes, um, was a decrease of 4.2 millimoles per mole. Now, not only that, but we also saw really high acceptability of the program um, and the people that received it. So they really liked the program, um, they liked the personalisation of it, and they liked the um, fact it was text messaging. So um, the vast, I think it was 97% said that they um, liked the fact it was delivered using text messaging. Um, and 100% of the people that we talked to said that they thought the program had been useful. Um, those those that were, we actually got them to rate the usefulness of the program and those that were identified as Māori or Pacific actually rated the program as being more useful, perceived to be more useful than those from other cultural groups. Um, and what was really nice was that the vast majority, uh, I think it was 95% said they'd recommend the program to other people with diabetes. And there were people that were really keen to see this rolled out. 
Um, so some of the features that they particularly liked about the program were the reminding aspect of it. So the fact that using text messaging capitalizes on the on, on the technology's prompting. Um, so the reminders to not only test their blood glucose if they'd opted for that module, but also people were saying that it reminded them to even think about their diabetes during the day, or that it reminded them to do things like take medication. Other features that they really liked was the motivational side of it. So the messages were all positively framed and designed to get them to care about their diabetes in the first place, so to actually consider and prioritise it. And people really noticed this about the messages and commented about um, really liking the motivation and empowerment um, of those. The social support element was also something that people really appreciated. And we actually saw um, when we, we measured our social support um, and people who received the SMS 4BG program experienced a significant reduction um, in that um, when compared to the control group. I'm sorry, of improvement in social support, not reduction. Um, and um, people commented on this as a feature they particularly liked about the program. So the fact that there was someone there that was contacting them in their everyday lives, even though they knew it came from a computer and the messages were automated. People did also comment on that sense of control, that idea that it gave them um, more control over their diabetes. So um, the fact that they started to engage with their diabetes and the behaviours around that, and that made them feel like they had more control over it and more control over other areas of their life as a result. Um, and so people um, felt like they were then going to their doctor with um, empowered to take uh, information along, their, their data, um, and have conversations about their diabetes with their clinicians. And um, lastly, people also noticed the tailoring and the personalization of the program. So we didn't um, really explain that to them, but they really appreciated the fact the messages came to them um, with their names in the messages. Um, we included the names of their support people um, and also um, the types of messages they were getting were the ones that they actually wanted and at the times of the day that they wanted them. Um, also, because they chose the modules themselves of the program, they ended up getting the, the number of messages associated with um, their choices. So if they chose lots and lots of modules, they got more messages. And so the vast majority of people actually said they were okay with the number of messages they got. And that is probably linked to the fact that they were choosing um, their content. We did have an independent um, health economist uh, undertake a cost effectiveness um, evaluation of the program well, in the study as well, and it was found to be cost effective um, uh, uh, as well. And I'm not going to go into these results in too much detail because I'm not a health economist, but um, we were really pleased to see that this was something that was a cost effective solution for supporting people with diabetes. Um, following the completion of the trial, we were really lucky to secure some additional funding. So this was separate to um, the main trial, um, but to follow up our participants at two years post randomization. Now, we weren't able to follow up everyone, um, unfortunately, but we were able to follow up about 70% of our participants um, to look at the HbA1c at two years. And we were pleasantly surprised to see that that reduction in HbA1c um, at two years um, was significantly greater still in the intervention group compared to the control group. And actually, the, um, the effect that we saw at nine months had been maintained in that uh, control um, in the intervention group, whereas the control group had actually returned to their baseline level approximately. So um, basically what the trial showed us was that um, the program was effective in improving clinical outcomes and that it was cost effective. And I suppose really importantly, it was a highly acceptable program um, to our population. They really liked it. And by developing it using the framework that Robin went through, um, we developed it in a way that we um, consulted and engaged with all of our end users right from the start. And so they were involved um, in the development process, but also an in interpretation of those findings. Um, and we know that the program is an evidence-based program, but going from research to practice has been a little bit more challenging. I'm gonna hand back to Robin to talk a little bit about our journey now, trying to take this program into implementation. Thanks. Rosie. Um, so, so a couple of things about implementation. Uh, we did have to work out obviously how much this was going to cost and that's always a factor of course. I mean it's the main factor actually really is getting the funding to get it implemented at the end. Um, so there's a, a, a setup cost for a text messaging program which involves gateway and short code setup and the IT setup. 
Uh, and then there are ongoing costs, which are actually very, very low, very minimal, which is the per text message costs and a small amount to maintain the program. So in reality, these programs are really fairly cheap once they've been set up. Uh, unfortunately, the way that research is funded, of course, we, um, we get the research trial funded and then with the funding ends. And so we end up having to turn the program off. And so then when we get some more implementation funding, we're having to, to redo that setup costs. Uh, so that would be something that we would really like to try and address in the future is how can we get the implementation funding so that we don't have to turn the program off uh, and then it will be even more cost effective just to keep the program running if that's at all possible. Uh, but there are other factors involved in whether uh, these programs can be successfully implemented at the end of the research uh, beyond just of course that we found it was really effective and acceptable as Rosie said. We still really need healthcare professional support. Uh, we would like to see this integrated as part of the normal service and normal support provided for people with diabetes, but that means we need the support of the health services. Uh, and although we had a lot of clinicians involved and although the funder was, was the um, health service, it's still really difficult to, to do that. That takes quite a lot of work that researchers might not have actually factored into their plans uh, as part of their research study. Uh, and we, we also really like to continue to be involved in the program uh, in the maintenance of the, the content in particular, not just the system, uh, which, which can be done in a variety of different ways by different people, but the maintenance of the content is really um, our key uh, involvement going forth. We want to make sure that the program is delivered in a way that is um, uh, true to how it was set up and also that gets updated with any changes to practice and be involved in ongoing evaluations of that. So our thought was that the best way to implement a program like this would be nationally. So uh, that map shows you where we are and where the program was running um, from. But uh, ideally, the, the setup uh, would be much more cost effective if it was done once nationally. And then different areas, different health services could pay those smaller ongoing costs for their own patients. Uh, so we've had a business case in with the Ministry of Health seeing if we can do that. Uh, but uh, in the interim, while we've been waiting for that, because uh, to be honest, that's about a year and a half now, um, we have also put in cases to our local health services to get it up and running just where we are within that smaller circle so that we can at least get it up and running and keep it going. Uh, and we're looking like that, that may happen in the near future. Uh, but implementation has been difficult, as Rosie says. Uh, and although in this case, we thought that we had all those factors covered, uh, we've done a lot of work with key stakeholders uh, trying to work out what we can do to make implementation smoother and easier at the end of our research trials when the research has been effective and our participants are saying, please keep this going. But it's still really difficult despite our best efforts at keeping the key stakeholders involved uh, and, and the, the other factors that we've mentioned. Uh, so we'd really like to, to keep working on this. I think this is you know, a subject of our future research is around how to do that translation from research into practice a little bit better. I'd just like to acknowledge all the people who've been involved in the study. There is a huge amount, uh, not just our co-investigators, our Māori advisory group, uh, the team here at NIHI who have run all our studies, but also all our study participants. Uh, as we've kind of mentioned throughout, but our funders have been the New Zealand Health Research Council, Waitamata and Auckland District Health Boards, uh, the Ministry of Health and New Zealand Society for the Study of Diabetes. Uh, so we're going to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn, the, turn it back on to us and we're happy to take any questions about that or any of our other mobile health work if you have questions. Great. Thanks, Robin and Rosie. That was excellent. Um, can I ask a question mm. while we're waiting for one to come through? Um, is what to what extent is this program potentially able to be adapted for other countries or other mm. contexts? It's evidence is that it worked very well here in New Zealand, but we're a high income country. Um, we have a public health system, uh, et cetera. So, so to what extent do you think this could be taken elsewhere mm. in another country and, and perhaps um, have a similar effect, hopefully. Yeah, that's a really good question and one that we're really interested in. Uh, with Jude, we have been working on some of our other programs, adapting them for um, some of the Pacific Islands, yep. uh, Samoa and the Cook Islands. Um, this, this program in particular, uh, 
you know, because text messaging is relatively easy thing yeah. to do, yeah. uh, we, you know, it is relatively easy to adapt for other contexts. So we've got kind of the intent behind it. We've got the, the general um, uh, meaning of the messages and the, of the program yeah. around support and motivation. So mm -hmm. what would be needed would be to go and work with the end users in a different context. Uh, as we showed in the beginning with our process, we would need to revisit that. So, but we wouldn't be starting from scratch. We could be taking the program that we've found to be effective and then working with local clinicians and local people with diabetes to find out what are their issues around support and motivation, what do, you know, what resonates with them out of the messages that are already written and what don't make any sense to them, because some of them won't make sense yeah. because of the different context of the health system and their views about their condition. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 easily transferable, but it does still require quite a bit of work for that local adaptation. Okay. Yeah. So Rosa, anything to add there? Yeah. So I think that I mean that's uh that's really good to hear. I mean, the work you've put into developing this program from New Zealand seems like there's potential uh, benefits um, in other settings, but adapting it perhaps culturally, um, contextually and, and linguistically is really important. Mm. But also um, you st have struggled with some of the implementation issues. And would you recommend anything? Any advice, any lessons learned about how you might be able to um, do this differently or try and um, increase the, uh, the chance that that may be implemented beyond a pilot in mm. another country, for yeah. example? I yeah. think the, the biggest one is around the funding model of the research itself. So that with the research and trial, somehow securing funding that if it is effective, that it can involve some of that implementation. So not leaving that out of the original proposal okay. um, and ideally not turning it off. So, you know, we, we sort of shut it down. If you can keep people tuning over with the program, that builds momentum. Um, it builds momentum in terms of funders wanting to actually fund a full yep. implementation of it. Um, I think it's probably the biggest thing for us in terms of what we would do differently. How important is um, having local sort of a sense for want of a better word ownership you know having your having the ministry of health really behind this in the beginning or having as well as having end users behind it i mean what's more important the end user <laughs> or the or the government those who will be actually yeah. running the program or is it both? i mean it is both but from our perspective the end users are key yeah. because if they don't use it if they don't like yeah. it then there's no point the ministry funding it yeah. yeah and that's a mistake that we've made before i'm sure okay. many countries have yeah where you know it seemed like a good idea to the people at the top yeah but if the people on the ground are not going to use it then that that is wasted money unfortunately mm. so i think we have to still have to have that initial focus that start with the people Absolutely. who are going to use it mm. um and then the um the, so then we we um, you know it is still important to get the ministry on board and one of the things that we found is not it's not just the rct kind of evidence results but it's those patient stories Absolutely. are really important so in that last slide the last photo was of one of our participants and we did a, a video of her story about why this program was good for her and why yeah. she liked it and those kind of patient stories are actually really key in um, getting stakeholders like the, the ministry and others on board to say why people like it and why they're going to use it yeah then it's it's more likely I think that they will come on board too that's, that's good to know I mean as you mentioned uh, the economic uh, cost benefit analysis is really important. They make sense to uh, people in, in ministries of, of finance um, mm -hmm. and in health. Um, so that's important, but it's the patient stories. Can I also add, I think one of the other groups that is really, really important to have on board during this is the clinicians or the health service level end users as well. Yeah. I think if we, we need promotion of the program to patients and ideally health um, workers or, or clinicians are the ones that are going to recommend the program to their patients. And if they're not on board with it, then it's probably not going to go anywhere either. So I think um, having them on board as early as possible is really beneficial. Yeah. Um, and just finally, one of the, I think one of the sort of uh, most uh, startling results, I think, from this SMS4BG um, trial was the fact that um, this text message, really simple, um, very accessible, it's very low cost intervention of supportive messages that are based on the theory of behaviour change were as effective as, as drug therapy. Mm. Um, was that something that surprised you? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very much so. Um, yes. So, I mean, it's it's based on good evidence where it's worked for other mm. things. So we were always very hopeful that it was going to have a good effect. But yes, as, as we were developing it, it seemed so simple that, that we were starting to doubt ourselves whether it would have, you know, a, a big enough effect that we'd be able to see it 
in the trial. Um, so to see those final um, trial results on HbA1c, which you know it's only one measure, but we knew that the diabetes clinician community yeah. were going to judge us on the HbA1c results in comparison with other things that they provide. So to be able to show that kind of parity with with other you know high quality drug trials and, and other program trials for diabetes is really important. Mm. As, as Rosie said about getting the clinicians on board, that's Absolutely. yeah. And I was like, <laughs> oh sorry. So I oh, know. So I've just got a question here from um, Mohammed Danladi from uh, Nigeria, and his question is, how do you think this method is possible to uh, for those who are living in really remote settings, so not just in in lower income settings, mm. but people who are remotely situated, um, and again, particularly in, in, in low income countries, developing countries. Yeah. So well, we know that um, that you know all. Uh, just about all of the world now yeah. is covered by, um, you know, at least kind of 3G, with a slightly yeah. less access to mobile phone networks. So, so the uh, mobile phone network uptake in even really remote and rural areas in the developing world mm. is really just starting to take off, and it's it's um, much more accessible than mm. you know internet mm. or health services yeah. or sometimes even places where there isn't electricity. Mm you know, there's still um, connectivity to the mobile okay. network. So, so, and text messaging is the, is the, is the smallest, mm. cheapest, you know, yes. the most ubiquitous way that you can send a message over the mobile network. Okay. So, so that's a really good it, opportunity. Yeah. To, to take that. Yeah. And I think the fundamentals of it being a program which is providing um, information and support rather than clinical guidance also makes it more potential or gives it more potential for those rural communities that may not be able to access that one-on-one -on -one yeah. clinical support. Um, and with the conditions like diabetes being a, or a huge component of that being behaviour, yeah. um, uh, therefore, you know, this kind of program can have huge relevance. Great. We also got another question um, from uh, Chris Patton, um, uh, Dr. Chris Patton, is could there be other sources of support from implementation? So thinking outside mm -hmm. those sort of more mainstream of, you know, research uh, organisations, such as perhaps looking at health care IT companies yep. mm -hmm. uh, or private practices, um, you know, do you think there's any sort of potential appetite for them to take this yeah. up and, and be contributors in this space? I mean, that's a yes. really good point and, uh, and may well be where we end up, <laughs> actually. So in New Zealand, we have, um, you know, we have a really high focus on our public health services. Yeah. And we really feel that programs like this should be provided by our public health service and it should be free to the end user. That's, you know, how our health service has been established yeah. Yeah. and run over the last, you know, 50 odd years. So, so we'd really like, you know, we have had a focus on trying to get it implemented in that way yeah. initially, yeah. because they have, uh, it has been public money that's gone into the development of it, mm -hmm. and we want New Zealanders to see the benefit of that without having to pay for it, and or or without having to restrict it to just a certain yeah. proportion of the population. Mm -hmm. right. So that has been our initial focus. But yes, uh, I agree there are other options and other alleys for trying to get this funded. Yeah. And we certainly have had approaches mm -hmm. uh, from uh, companies, yeah. uh, from private institutions, from um, small pub, uh, primary health organisations uh, and from a health IT company. Uh, but it often comes with... Um, caveats, which is we're only going to provide it to this group of people, yeah. or we're, we're going to charge people for it, or or some other things like that. So yes, we may well um, end up going down that alley, and I could see that that being um, much more useful internationally as well. Those other kind of funders, yeah. but uh, but we've had we've, we're trying really hard to get it funded publicly first in New Zealand, yeah. and if that doesn't work, then we will go down those alleys. And I think it raises that issue around the um, when we're designing these and this well, there's more and more co-design involved in designing these kind of programs and um, this one had quite a lot of participatory engagement with that program and so feeling like if we were to make it available those people that invested their time and energy in designing it need to have access to it and as soon as we start going with some kind of funder that's going to restrict the access or charge the end user is that ethically fair when there's been people that have contributed this and sh to this and might not suddenly have access to it? Um, and so those are the kind of questions that need to be worked through if we were to go down that path. But at the end of the day, we want to see this made available. And if that's the only way we can do that, then, then yeah. it is an option we will definitely go down. Yeah. Great. Um, and I've just got uh, one more question, and it relates to Muhammad's question to some extent, mm -hmm. is that how important are the telcos, the, mm. the telecommunications organisation? Mm. We know from our previous experience um, working mm. uh, 
uh, with colleagues in Samoa and currently in, with colleagues in, in the Cook Islands, having that tel local telco yeah. is, is, seems to be very important. From your perspective, yeah, it what? is really important, and yeah. we've seen this, you know, in lots of places internationally as well. That that it's important actually because they can be a hindrance, they can be a, a barrier to getting it out there if they're not on board. Yes. In some places, um, the the mobile network operator environment does vary around the world, so their influence does does vary, and yeah. you do have to know what it what the context is wherever you are. Yeah. Um, but in, in some countries, we have seen them actually be a bit of a barrier to widespread use uh, because they're not on board. So we think it's really important to get them on board from the very beginning. Yeah. They can certainly make everything much easier. We do have to connect up somehow yeah. the engines that send the messages yeah. with the people who are yeah. on the mobile phone. So yeah. we do have to go through the mobile network operators. Mm -hmm. In some countries that's easier and some it's a little bit more difficult. But really ideally, um, you know, what we'd like to see is uh, organisations like Ministries of Health having a direct relationship with their mobile network yeah. operators uh, and that would make things a huge amount easier uh, and that also could make it a huge amount cheaper if the um, in some countries the telcos have actually got an agreement with the Ministry of Health to send health messages yeah. cheaper or even free and so that per person cost yeah. of maintaining a program ongoing can be much cheaper if they've got um, that kind of relationship going on and is that something you would both see as, as perhaps becoming a more important partnership? So the ministry and the telcos working more closely as we start to move in a much more, I guess, digital to IT oriented mm. health care system. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. think that it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it, it's a, it, then it's a kind of a government uh, owned and, and um, supported programs that are getting that getting through and so it's not like spam it's not yeah. like everyone can do it yeah it's like you know these are government supported programs and they're government priorities yeah and so even in New Zealand we're having a little trial at the moment of um, some telcos zero rating data for particular Ministry of Health apps for example mm -hmm. so that's not the text messaging but it's still it's the same kind of idea and when you say zero rating, you mean uh, so that it's that it doesn't use up doesn't, people's data, okay, so, it's, so it's, it's free important. basically. Yeah. yeah, because one of the issues uh, or the, the in areas of interest that we have um, working together is ensuring that everyone has access to these yeah. uh, to these uh, programs. Mm -hmm. So really, not wanting these sort of interventions to exacerbate inequities within a within a population. So yes, exactly. having uh, access uh, free. Um, or as or as mm -hmm. low cost as possible is, is really important. Mm -hmm. it seems. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, Great. Is there anything more you'd like to add? No. no. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was an Very excellent good. session. Um, uh, Dr. Robin Whitaker and Dr. Rose Lee Dobson. Um, appreciate your time, and um, we'll close off now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.